Welcome to this Architecture Today webinar with Programme Partners Shuko, a place of greater safety. In a moment, your chair, Ruth Slavid, but first, Shuko UK's Commercial Director, Sean Butler. Welcome to the latest in our series of 80 Shuko webinars. In today's webinar, we will look at the implications for architects once the new Building Safety Regulator has been established under the provisions of the Building Safety Bill currently going through Parliament. The bill has been spurred by Dame Judith Hackett's review of building regulations and fire safety, which highlights the need for significant cultural and regulatory change in the wake of the Grenfell fire for high-rise residential homes. Our four expert speakers will consider the implications of the new legislation and discuss whether practices need to skill up to ensure compliance with the new building safety regime. The new regulator will oversee every stage of a building's life cycle, from design, construction, and completion to occupation, implementing specific gateway points where safety has to be considered and set out in a golden thread of information, created, stored, and updated throughout the building's life cycle. I'm looking forward to today's discussion and hope our experts can reassure us that the proposals will indeed simplify the existing system and explain how we can do our part to ensure high standards are continuously met in the future, guaranteeing that high-rise residents can be confident of living in a place of greater safety. Thank you once again for joining us. I'll now pass you to Ruth, who's chairing today's event. Thanks very much, Sean. I'm really pleased to be here because this is, as you said, such an important subject. I think there are a lot of opportunities, but obviously there's quite a lot to worry about and a lot that people are going to have to learn. And I think we will all go away knowing a lot more than we do at the moment. I'd just like to talk to you a little bit about the format. We have four speakers. I will be introducing them as we go along. There will be the opportunity for brief questions at the e end of each presentation and then we will be bringing all the speakers together at the end uh, for a general discussion again responding to your questions so please when something occurs to you do please send your question in and we will select some of them and use those in our question sessions and in our discussions and as i said we have a really interesting set of speakers today uh, we have Jessica Barker, who's a partner at Stolon Architects, who is going to give us quite a personal view on um, fire safety. We have Tom Roach, who is a senior consultant on international codes and standards at uh, Insurer FM Global. And we have Paul Bussey, who is a real specialist in fire, uh, who is at AHMM. But first of all, I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker, who is Jerry Tate, a partner at Tate & Co Architects. Jerry. Thank you, Ruth. That's great. Um, so, hello, everybody. I'm going to talk to you today about how architects, or I think architects, should be responsible uh, for the golden thread of design information, how we already perform this role in reality, and how this might lead to protection of function for architects. Uh, so, moving on. This is us at Tate & Co. Uh, we are a team of about 11. Uh, we are architects based in East London. And this is our office, which is quite a good portrait of us, really. Lots of natural light, uh, materials and plants. And this is the range of work we get up to. And we specialise really in sustainable buildings that are set in sensitive landscape or heritage settings but because of the nature of these projects although we you know definitely a design-led practice we often take a central coordinating role on the project and that's because you know normally there are kind of key uh, technical or statutory requirements which need significant work to achieve not all of which you'd view as sort of classically creative but all of which is central to actually creating you know the end product which is the building so I think, you know, in many ways, this is aligned really with the concept of the golden thread. You know, I think looking after the golden thread of design information is actually something that we already do, certainly us in our work as, as architects and professionals. Um, so let me explain that a bit more, maybe with three projects. And then after that, we'll just dwell a bit on the golden thread itself. 
So the first project I thought I'd show you is a heritage project, which is uh, the Brunel Museum in Rotherhithe, London. And we've been working with the museum since 2015 on a sort of overall master plan to improve the museum experience. And we completed phase one in 2016, which is, which is this. It's the conversion of a below ground area called the sinking shaft. Um, and we've also assisted the museum with obtaining uh, a heritage fund grant uh, to deliver phase two, which is a sort of above ground area, which we're, we're just about touch wood to get planning for, hopefully, uh, listed building consent. And the, the museum is based at the southern end of the Thames Tunnel. So actually, uh, this is the Thames Tunnel here under the Thames and that below ground shaft you were looking at in the photograph a minute ago is, is this here. And um, it's the last structure by Mark Brunel, the first structure by Isambard Kingdom Brunel, uh, and the first tunnel under a river in the world. So uh, it's quite an amazing thing. Um, so that means it's a scheduled monument, it's a listed structure, and also because the, you know, the overground, the orange line in London still runs underneath it, it's still a live piece of TfL infrastructure. And what that means really is a very complex statutory and design team matrix, essentially. So um, this is a diagram that we did of all the different uh, statutory bodies, design team bodies, all the people we had to talk to just to deliver phase one, which was actually a much smaller phase than, than phase two. And, you know, I know that we produced uh, this diagram. So, you know, I, I understand that um, yeah, we're going to make ourselves look really important. But genuinely, I, I, I think that we are, as architects, the only people really in the middle of the process who have sufficient overview to coordinate and link up all these different stakeholders and, and drive the project through to completion. So that's us in the middle there. And the second project I thought I'd touch on is our work with the Eden project in Cornwall. Um, now I'm going to confess that I was the original um, one of the original project architects uh, for the Eden project working for Grimshaw Architects and then since you know starting um, our, uh, our own firm uh, since 2011 really Tate and Company have been working for Eden helping them realise a number of projects on their Cornwall site. So, for example, we assisted Eden with obtaining a Wellcome Trust grant to entirely refurbish their education building, including classrooms, a gallery, cafe and new exhibition. Uh, it was all based on the theme of invisible worlds. So things that are too big, small, fast, slow to perceive, but which drive our natural world. And this is the centrepiece which we helped create with the artist's studio swine uh, called uh, Infinity Blue. It's very cool. It blows sort of smoke rings out. Um, but a really good example of the kind of projects I was talking about where, you know, design and coordination are equally important is, is this project, basically, which is the rainforest canopy walkway in the, the rainforest biome. So you can see this is a sort of bridge element here. And essentially, it's a series of linked bridge walkways snaking through the existing rainforest trees so um you know meaning you can get up to the tree canopy and you can really understand that the very important bit of how the rainforest works and the point about this really is that all the trees in the biome now are effectively priceless um you know because they're mature trees it's almost impossible to do live imports anymore of these kind of trees so you'd have to grow them from scratch so this means that we had to you know, prefabricate everything and bring it all through an airlock in the biome uh, to maintain the 17 degrees C minimum temperature. But it also meant we had to work closely with the engineering contractor team to develop a sort of floating pile solution, uh, which you can see us you know, looking at here, the kind of air spade, uh, uh, helical piles, floating pile cap. And so the creation of this project was partly kind of classic design, but very much about leading a coordinated and uh, uh, construction design effort, if you like, to, to realise it. And the third and final project I thought I'd touch on is the new creative centre for York St John University, which is a new theatre, recital hall and 2,500 square metres of creative teaching space. So the building contains a number of kind of technically very complex spaces, particularly here in the sort of teaching area at the back, and they're all linked with this beautiful timber framed atrium to promote cross disciplinary collaboration. So the project's on site, it's being delivered under traditional contract. So, you know, we're providing all the design information. It's due to complete uh, at the end of October, touch wood, hopefully. Um, and this is an organogram showing, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the setup of the project, if you like. And you can see here that 
all the design team, the sub consultants to take and company, you know, as requested by the university. So the combination of traditional contract type and, you know, this appointment where we've got all the sub consultants working for us means, you know, we are put simply responsible for the design information. And what we're finding is that these appointment types are becoming more and more prevalent in the industry, you know, particularly with education institutions, which is understandable, where, um, you know, it, it's a much lower administrative burden for them and it's much cleaner for them to have a single contract point of entry. And it's either us or the project manager who are the people who are kind of sub consulting all of the design information. So, you know, that kind of ultimate responsibility for design information, you know, really looking after the coordination there brings me onto the concept really of the golden thread. We are a strongly led design practice, uh, uh, but we have also, frankly, been the keepers of the coordinated design information for all of those projects I've just mentioned. And in fact, many of the projects we, we, we've done full stop as a practice. And Dame Judith Hackett in uh, Building a Safer Future envisaged the concept of this golden thread of design information base. That's, that's where the term came from. So in that report, she talked about a clear record of good quality information covering four areas. We've got the digital record, the fire and emergency plans, full plans, and the construction control plan. And I think, you know, what really interests us probably is the digital record, because Dame Judith was very clear that the digital record is basically a BIM model. So building information modeling model, like a Revit model, right? So the question is, in a normal project, who is going to be the holder of the BIM model? You know, and in our experience, it is the architect. So whilst the draft building safety bill, this is the front cover of it here, it's sort of 200 page document, um, does not mention the golden thread, actually the exact nature of the golden thread is still being worked through. So there are sort of two steps beyond the original safety bill. Um, the, the first one is, is, is setting out the golden thread regulations, i.e. sort of the essential principles, like what it's for. And the second is the golden thread guidance, which will set out uh, best practice and how the golden thread will mesh with the existing regulations. So we've still got these sort of two key uh, stages to go through in setting out what the golden thread means. So as a profession, architecture, we've still got time to set out our stall on this. And I think this is, you know, really important because whilst, um, you know, at Tate and Company, we quite often act as the principal designers. So, uh, but we actually tend to subcontract the administrative part of this to another company quite often. So uh, architect responsibilities here, where we're kind of looking after design coordination, principal designer role on the right, where, you know, we, we, we're essentially doing that kind of, almost that CDM coordinator role, but it is all under kind of our umbrella. If a key part of the principal designer role were maintaining the golden thread, it would bring together the two roles we currently already fulfill. So it would really mesh and bring forward something that we're already doing. So what exactly am I proposing? Well, I think that architects should be responsible for maintaining the golden thread of design information on a project. I also think that there should be a minimum level of information for each proposed gateway. So the gateways are the sort of staging posts for submission uh, for the new safety regulator, basically. There'll be, there'll be one at planning, uh, one at building reg stage, and, and, and one at the end. Um, uh, you know, including, I think, actually, frankly, a full specification should be required prior to construction. Now, this would, in effect, be protection of function for architects. And, you know, whilst recently, you know, we've been kind of averse to that in the UK, so architects at the moment in the UK do not have protection of function. It is worth bearing in mind that many other countries have protection of function for architects, including, for example, um, you know, licensed architects in the USA who literally sign drawings. Without that, you can't build a building. You know, the USA is an extremely capitalist country. So, you know, it's not something that we, we couldn't achieve. And there would be some clear benefits from this. Architects have a terrific understanding uh, of the overall building as a system, if that makes sense. So Dame Judith in her report uh, uh, was clear really that the tragic mistake at Grenfell was not necessarily the use of aluminum composite cladding. Moreover, it was a lack of understanding of the fire risk overall that was a sort of fatal and tragic error that led to the problems at Grenfell. 
Um, but beyond kind of that issue as well, there could also be a dramatic effect on the quality of design and construction generally. And, you know, as architects who are passionate about sustainability, you know, we have clients like the Eden Project, the National Trust, the Habitat First Group, the Scout Association. I mean, you know, that's, that's where we are. We know that being responsible for the golden thread of design information would allow huge strides in creating and refurbishing buildings that would genuinely reduce our carbon footprint. Um, you know, and I, and, I, and I know there might be some concerns. I, I think, you know, one of the concerns might be if architects would be able to increase their fees to cover an increase in service, which, which I understand. I mean, I, I think if it was a statutory duty, that would be uh, an easier thing to negotiate. Um, and I think also architects might be concerned about taking on more responsibility when insurance premiums are skyrocketing. I'm a, sorry, and this is an Architects Today podcast. This is an uh, Architects Journal um, <clears throat> diagram. I shouldn't mention that, should I? But, um, you know, it, just showing that, that, that concern in the industry. But I honestly think that a rigorous architect-led approach to the golden thread of design information would reduce claims overall and therefore premiums. So as a profession, you know, I think we need to seriously consider lobbying for the protection of function in the UK with architects as the guardians of the golden thread of design information. By showing leadership, we will be bringing forward a truly workable solution to ensure that our built environment is safe and sustainable. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think it's great that we've started with such an optimistic um, attitude. And I think a lot of the work that you've done, obviously it's really good work and you say you're taking the design responsibility. Um, I just wonder how would this approach that you're talking about work uh, when you're talking about uh, projects that are design and build or contractor led or do you think that somehow other than I can't imagine them all disappearing? Yeah, well, so interestingly, uh, sort of 50% of the projects uh, that we have on our books are, are quite often design and build, actually. And, and, and I think that even in design and build setup, someone's got, someone's got to be looking after all the design work, basically. And, and, and I think design and build is actually much maligned as well, in truth. You know, I think it depends who the contractor is. So I, I do understand the point that, you know, in a design and build, it's difficult to defend the design, if you like, because you're inside a kind of fixed contract situation quite often. But again, I think that strengthens the case for something like the golden thread of design information, because, you know, if there is a minimum level of information that must exist before a project is built, you know, whether it is um, uh, under the, you know, umbrella of a con contractor doing everything, or whether it is uh, kind of pre-contract stage, that would ensure that there is at least sufficient design information. You know, I, I don't, I think that, you know, the quality of the building is partly specification and partly how people mm -hmm. do things, but a lot of the bad things you get from a design and build contract is just lack of information, that there isn't enough. And who would be producing that information? Well, yeah, no, well, I think that, <laughs> somebody needs to be coordinating it right so you know it's mm -hmm. not that i mean it's, it sounds a bit like a paragraph for architects on my part so i'm really sorry and and i'm not saying the architects should be you know producing all the information for all the buildings it's not a kind of like german Gesundheit thing you know like the Bauhaus where we yeah. do all the furniture and the handles and everything. but i think somebody does need to say our job is to coordinate this design and to make sure everything works and to make sure it is safe and to make sure it is sustainable um, and I, I actually do genuinely think that that is the architect's responsibility. Um, but the trouble is, it's not always our responsibility on all jobs. Quite often, we're just employed. So sometimes people try to employ us just to sort of do the architecture, you know, to do the architectural drawings. And, and it's unclear whose job it is then to sort mm. of make sure that everything works together. You know, and, and I think, it, you know, if, if, if architects were um, statutory responsible for the golden thread, that would mean that by default, we have to be the people, you know, coordinating all this information and making sure it all, it all works together in, in a sort of safe manner. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, you talk about power grab. We've had one or two questions coming in, which I'm not <laughs> going to put to you because I'm going to save them for our group, group discussion at the end <laughs> when obviously you can have an yeah. input to it. But, you know, people are saying things like, is the building safety bill re repairing the damaged fire safety inflicted by the 2006 regulatory reform order, you know, which 
took obligations mm. away from the fire officer. And also someone mm. else is saying, how is the golden thread any different from what LCC architects knew and practiced in the 1960s? Now, I'm happy to say there's <laughs> nobody actually on this panel who was working in the 1960s. Um, yeah. But it is that feeling that maybe we might be going back. And I just parking that for our other speakers as well to kind of think <laughs> about for our final discussion. But now uh, we're going to move on to our next speaker. I'm delighted uh, to introduce uh, our next speaker who is Jessica Barker, who is a partner at Stolon Architects. Jessica. Well, thank you for the introduction. Yes, I'm, I'm Jessica Barker and I'm a director at Stolon Studio. Over the years, we've specialised in backland and infill developments, places that are difficult to reimagine, design within, get planning and to build on. And we also specialise in sociable architecture, architecture that considers the community support and well-being of the people that use it. At planning stages, we have to demonstrate that the bins can be picked up, cars can park and turn, privacy and access to light are well and well-being are high on our agenda. Whilst design preoccupations can focus around light, aesthetics, materials and landscaping, there is nothing more detrimental to mental health and well-being than fear and fear of not being safe in your own home. Prior to setting up my practice, my background is of new build hotels and housing, as well as many uh, interesting projects at my time at Ron Arad Architects. At consultation, at planning consultation, fire and emergency access often comes up. Comments that the design team have addressed, but in terms of planning policy, um, was considered irrelevant at planning. So can you get planning for a building that won't comply with fire safety regulations? Yes, absolutely. In short, up until July this year, an application for an exact replica of Grenfell Tower could be approved without there being any consideration of fire safety, whether that is technical fire safety compliance or the fear of poor fire safety. What ignited my concerns over the conundrum of fire safety and planning was unfortunately very close to home. I witnessed a fire in a low rise block of flats in a converted Victorian building four fire engines and 21 firefighters attended and three lone children were rescued from the third floor of a burning building. It was found that that building didn't have any working fire detection and that the escape was insufficient. It was nothing to do with cladding. As a mother, I was devastated. Three months later, the building owner applied to further intensify the apartments, squeezing two bedrooms where there was only space for one and in a building already highlighted as having inadequate escape, they applied to remove one of the fire escapes. Naturally, I objected, supplying information regarding the fire, the fire report and the escapes, but the application was approved. As an architect, I was devastated. After many months of emails from planners, councillors and my MP, I had to accept that planning didn't consider fire safety as a material consideration. And in the meanwhile, the building work to the converted building was carried out without what I thought was a building control application. I then launched a petition to government to add fire safety to the list of material considerations at planning. Sadly, it didn't gain the 10,000 signatures required for it to be debated in Parliament, but it did help to spark a debate with architects, planners and policymakers. I felt that this simple addition to existing legislation would highlight the need to consider fire safety at the very earliest stages of design. It was not the intention to overlap or replace building control. In light of this campaign and rising awareness of the issues through the Hackett Review, fire safety was introduced into the draft London plan. The latest draft London plan for the very first time introduces a specific policy on fire safety. And if adopted, the boroughs will need to comply with this policy when they review their development plans. 
Draft Policy D11 seeks to establish a high standard of fire safety de design in all developments by requiring applicants to consider pertinent issues such as fire, fire spread, risk to life, means of escape and firefighting provisions at the outset of the development design process. The draft plan also introduced a requirement for all major development proposals to be submitted with a fire statement to address safety issues. London leads the way in transforming the industry's approach to fire safety design. That's great. I'm very impressed. But what about buildings outside of the capital? Last month, Gateway One was introduced. Following the Grenfell Tower fire, the government commissioned the independent review of building regulations and fire safety led by Dame Judith Hackett. The report highlighted the need to transform fire and building safety regime and recommended that some minimum requirements around fire safety will need to be addressed when local planning authorities are determining planning applications and will require input from those with the relevant expertise. Government made a commitment in a reformed building safety regulatory system, a government response to the Building a Safer Future consultation um, to introduce Planning Gateway 1. Planning Gateway 1 has two key elements, to require the developer to submit a fire statement setting out fire safety considerations specific to that development and to establish the health and safety executive as a statutory consultee for relevant planning applications. I welcome the change in approach. The cost to human life isn't just measured in deaths. The fear and anxiety over fire safety has been detrimental to human health and mental well-being. Any initiative that has the potential to promote safer buildings should be viewed positively. The draft London Plan and Planning Gateway One have the potential to confront some of the most fundamental fire safety considerations early and to make fire safety an integral part of good design. But does this go far enough? Let's look at the statistics regarding fires. In the year ending December 2020, there were 27,482 primary dwelling fires attended by the Fire and Rescue Services in England. That's 75 fires a day spread across 24 million dwellings in England. The vast majority of those fires, 91%, were in houses, bungalows, converted or low rise, that's three stories or lower, flats whereas only 9% were in blocks of flats of four storeys or more. In 2020, 176 people in total lost their lives in dwelling fires, of which 10 fatalities were in blocks of flats of four or more storeys. That's 95% of all house fire related deaths were in low rise buildings. That's under four storeys. Whilst even one death is a tragedy, the majority of deaths are in low rise buildings. Very few fires spread from the room where they start and incidences of fire spread are rarer in blocks of flats over four storeys than in lower rise dwellings. In 2019 to 2020, 7% of fires spread beyond the room of origin in blocks of flats over four storeys, compared with 9% in blocks below four storeys and 14% in houses, bungalows, converted flats and other dwellings. There's a double standard emerging. And why is fire a planning matter? Isn't this mocked up? by building control? Yes and no. In researching for this talk, I've interviewed some building control officers that we're working with, and there are dozens of examples of projects that they have um, where buildings have had to go back to planning to add fire escapes, to remo remove windows along boundaries because fire safety was overlooked at initial stages. Furthermore, planning is key to the issue because it looks outside of the red line application. It looks at the spaces between buildings, how buildings are designed and accessed. And even planning gateway one states, as many fire safety matters relevant to planning impact on the external layout of a site, 
not only the building over 18 metres or seven storeys, the relevant building, it includes the spaces between buildings. Planning assesses the impact of proposals outside of the red line. We are currently working in the London bor borough of Southwark and whilst we are working on new proposals for new housing, we are also working with the local authority, the fire brigade and the residents to look at the existing housing stock and to improve fire safety uh, for, for the existing estate as well. As architects, we should welcome the changes in policy, welcome the changes in planning. Um, but I think that these things can actually go further. And I, I really support the initiative of the golden thread. The golden thread is both the information that allows you to understand the building and the steps needed to keep both the building and the people safe now and in the future. But I'd like to think of it not as a thread, but actually part of a net to promote safe considered design which starts at the earliest part point for all buildings. Thank you, Jessica. I think that's actually quite devastating. Um, I have seen some of those figures before, but I think it's too easy with the absolute horror that Grenfell was to think, oh, high rise is the problem and nothing else. Um, and I think you've really reminded us why we do need to do something about it. Um, I know you've been pushing for changes in planning law, but what sort of changes in attitude do you think are needed from the profession um, in order to ensure the fire safety in the buildings that they design? Well, um, I, 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 I don't want to defer the question, but I, I from listening to what Jerry was uh, saying, I, I thoroughly support that role of having someone overseeing, someone coordinating, and that role uh, pretty much being taken up by by the architect um, the, the the person that is um, most concerned with the, the the whole of the building from start to finish and that 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 golden thread is held by the architect really so the other thing I want to ask you about is you know I know in your practices work you've done all sorts of interesting and unusual things we saw a little bit of your work very quickly at the beginning um, now, obviously, you are thinking about these issues all the time in the designs that you do. And I just just wonder if you've got any advice for other architects, because there has been traditionally amongst architects a feeling that fire and designing for fire is just one of the constraints that's stopping them doing anything interesting. I mean, how do you think you change that mindset? Because you're obviously not finding it a constraint. You're still able to work very freely and imaginatively. Um, I, it's it's one of the many constraints that you have to work within. And it's, um, I mean, it's a, a fundamental, as I said in the talk, I think the fear, if, if you're interested in improving people's lives and designing something that, that is, is good for everybody, um, it's, it's it's one of the most basic things that we have to do um and i think especially when we're working in infill sites um you know something like 36 party wall um agreements that might have to uh, be negotiated as part of it that's that's just part of doing that sort of work so it's just another thing that has to be considered and and considering it at the outset at the beginning of the design process is how you overcome any of the problems because you, you're not then having to backtrack and rework something. It's just, it's one of the parameters that you have to design within and it isn't something to be feared because there is information out there. As soon as you understand the issues and the problems and, and how you can solve these things and involve other other consultants if if you if you need to um it's it's all out there um and the information is is there for, for the for the taking really so um and i think one of the things that was great about that presentation was the fact that you did talk not just about you know loss of life but actually about fear as that being another important consideration and we're going to move on to our next speaker now um uh, who is tom tom roach of FM Global. And I know that he's also going to be talking about yet another aspect of fire. In other words, not just um, loss of life, which causes our absolutely preeminent concern, 
but actually the um, issues that can be caused by damage to buildings as well. Tom. Thank you very much. So as an insurer, I'm probably going to take a slightly different tack to this problem than our previous panellists. But in considering a, a place of greater safety, I think it's obvious to me that we need to find a place where we must manage risk and must manage risk well if we're going to make a complete change. But I think the story starts a little bit earlier for me. And I want to sort of start earlier because I, as an insurer and somebody who's worked in the world of insurance and property insurance in particular, uh, it's always strikes me that everybody has slightly different views of risk and indeed of fire. So I'll start my story, if I may, back in 1993. I was obviously much younger then, but the challenge of fire and fire risk was still top of mind for me. Uh, I remember very vividly traveling to Humberside to visit a plant uh, that was going to build an extension. And if you remember back to that time, if you're of a certain age like me, you remember there was a lot of discussion about composite metal panels with polystyrene insulation. And the surprise for me was at this plant, a very well-respected construction professional was proposing to use exactly that type of panel to build the extension to this plant. And I must admit, I thought maybe they knew something I didn't. So I started to ask more questions about, well, what did they imagine would happen in the event of a fire? And surprisingly, their view that in the event of a fire was all the panels that made up the new building would simply just burn off. Everything else would be left intact inside the building. And I, as an insurer, should not worry. They would simply reclad it. I remember sitting there agog at the time thinking, maybe I just don't understand this. But what I've come to learn is actually there are different views of what a fire will look like, what the impact of a fire will be. And I think that's an important part of this story as we sort of try and seek a place of greater safety is we need to think about, do we share the same view? Because I can tell you now that a fire in a building, polystyrene panels will not look pretty. It will be quite devastating. And I had to tell that to a very respected building professional at the time, and we didn't quite agree. We had different perspectives of what an outcome in the event of fire would be. And I think that's something that over time has remained and it's something that we need to change. So let me take this story a little bit further forward. Fire for me still remains a leading cause of loss in property. It's why it's top of mind for a number of insurers. That, that metric hasn't really changed over time. Yes, we've seen new risks sort of being insured, cyber, we've started to talk about viruses, we've talked about denial of access, but fire still remains a leading cause of property loss. So it's still top of mind. It's still a thing that insurers think about. And that hasn't changed. And perhaps it's gone top of mind with a lot of other people recently because of tragic events. There's been a number of high profile fires and not, I'm not just talking about Grenfell Tower. I'm talking about high profile fires that have led to extensive amounts of damage uh, to a series of buildings, whether it be a school like this one or uh, a number of sort of residential blocks of flats, even industrial commercial properties. The thing that always strikes me is that difference in perspective. And it's typified by the statement that's on screen, which is this is a building that complied with relevant building regulations. And people have told me this in the event of a, a fire that's caused what I would call disproportionate damage. And once again, it's reinforced with me that People have different views of what's going to happen in the event of a fire, but also different views as to what success is. So for some people, the fire that you're looking at on screen is a success. No one was injured. No firefighters were injured. The fire was contained to one property. It did not spread. The fact that several hundred children had no school to go to were displaced across a, a county. That's not important. The success was no one was injured. And the fire didn't spread. Whereas from my perspective, and particularly as an insurer, I look at that and think, there's no way you can claim that to be a success. No one would look at that in the aftermath and think, that makes sense. Yes, it can be an unfortunate incident, but that's not typified by success. And I think that's at the heart of what I, I think we need to think about as we go forward 
and we think about a place of greater safety is what does success look like? What would it mean in the future when we have fires in buildings? What will success be typified by? Will it look like this or will it be something different? As an insurer, people have often come to me and said, well, why do insurers have concerns? And I think like many of the other people on this panel, you can't have escaped uh, the challenges that have come forward as a result of the Grenfell Tower inquiry, the response to Grenfell Tower. Even when you stop and think about this, Dame Judith Hackett wrote her report on building a safer future. And there's a quite a chilling statement in there for me. And I use the word chilling because when you stop to think of the ramifications of this, it means a lot about our built environment as it stands today. And she came to that conclusion that the current system of building regulations and fire safety is not fit for purpose. That's quite a statement to make. And it means quite a bit about how we may have got to where we are and some of the challenges we may have locked into our built environment. At the same time, that same document and a number of other people challenged the guidance that we have in place today around building regulations and they use the word ambiguous. And that phrase is being used several times in relation to elements of guidance around building regulations. So if I start off in a world where I'm not sure everybody has the same perspectives on fire, what are the outcomes that we expect in the face of fire? And then I land with a couple of reports that are telling me the building regulations are not fit for purpose and the guidance derived from them is ambiguous. It's no surprise that a lot of people are confused over, well, how good are the buildings that we have built today? How good will be their performance in the event of a fire? And I'm not just talking about, will they keep people safe, but what will they look like after a fire? Uh, a lot of people are sort of anxious because of things that are happening in, the, you know, in terms of insurers. But I have to say, you have to look back to some of these statements and say, well, if you were living through that space and you wore the hat of an insurer and looked at this, what would you be thinking about the risk that you're trying to underwrite? So when it comes to underwriting risk, we have to think about the quality and the quantum of the risk. And given all the statements I've made before, there's something there that we need to think about. But we can't assume that we've understood exactly how a building will perform. We have to ask questions about how it will work. We have to gather information on that building. We have to check those details. We need somebody to probably inspect them. Even for me as a commercial industrial property insurer, we have to go through some of those processes as I have done for most of my career, but I'm watching more and more people do that in other insurance companies. But we also have to be clear about what's the risk we're actually concerned about. For me, it's about what will happen to the property. For some others who make an assessment of the building, it may be how safe are the people. They may not lead to the same conclusions. They are similar but they may not lead to the same place. At the same time, while all this has been going on as people try to understand in response to what's going on in the sort of building bump, what's happening, we've seen a blizzard of consultations and reviews. And that has led to a lot of people asking questions, challenging information, challenging test results, challenging testing systems, which leads to a level of confusion and a lack of clarity. And all those things feed into this sense that, do we really understand some of the risks that we have within our built environment? Have we really understood how these buildings will perform? And therefore, it's no surprise to me that people are looking at me as an insurer and saying, well, what's changed? I have to tell you, all these things have changed the dynamic. They've changed the context in which people view risk, particularly around buildings and the built environment. And those things need to come back together for us to sort of go to a, a better place. So the Building Safety Bill has uh, recently been put forward in draft form and it's now going through scrutiny. Um, I personally look at that and say, it's a step in the right direction. Uh, we will see a new regulator for building safety. We will see new duty holder roles and quite clear responsibility. And we'll see processes like gateways for changes. But I don't believe the Building Safety Bill in and of itself 
is some sort of golden answer. I know a lot of people are getting confused by things like the building safety bill and the fire safety bill because they're looking at them saying, that's the answer to all the problems. No, if we're gonna build this safer uh, place and we're gonna get buildings to perform as we believe they should, then I think actually we need to do some other things. So I think it leads to, if I answer the brief to this sort of, this whole presentation, what's needed? Well, actually we need to broaden and sharpen skills. And I say that looking at some people who may have made comments to me in the, in the past about how buildings perform in fire. And that means understanding how materials perform in a fire. Systems that we place in buildings, how do they behave? Whether it's a sprinkler system, well, what can that do? What are the benefits of it? How will it change the dynamics of the risk in the building? And similarly, what will it mean for a firefighter to come into a building to try and tackle the fire? What are they facing? What systems have we put in place for them? Have we put the right systems in place for them to be able to tackle that event? So broadening and sharpening skills is something that I see will be needed in a wide variety of areas, including architects. Similarly, this sounds really strange, but there's one thing that I've learned in the last five years, and it's reinforced things from my whole career. We're not very good at managing and retaining information when it comes to buildings. And what that means is we're going to have to become better at it. It's not going to happen by chance. People are going to be, have to be deliberate uh, to capture information about a building. How was it built? What were the materials used? What test records are available? And even more critically, if changes are made, what's that process for managing that change and documenting it? People are talking about a golden thread that might be a limited amount of information, but for me, we have to become better at managing, retaining information about the building and what are the safety systems within it? And very critically, how we manage that change around those systems. The next part is a bit of a, a strange one, but we have to mind the gaps. Remember that the building safety bill is targeted at a focus group of buildings. The built environment has a vast array of other buildings which have similar fire safety issues, and we need to think about those. So another thing that I, I would say is, let's not get too focused on just one type of building. We need to sharpen those skills, retain that information about the whole built environment, because as we change, those fire safety implications are in those other buildings too. So we have to mind the gap. This is a pretty tough one. Anybody who remembers the Billy Connolly business plan will know what I'm saying when I say, you know, stay awake, it's all gonna change tomorrow. Well, this is exactly what I think is going to happen. We're gonna to have to get used to change. Our guidance needs to change more regularly. It amazes me that prior to Grenfell Tower fire, uh, an Apple iPhone was newer than the latest revision <laughs> of you know, or the deep review of our building regulatory guidance. That's amazing to me. Think how much the built environment has changed in 10 years. Think of the new materials we're looking at. Think of the new ways we're trying to use buildings. Our guidance needs to keep pace and so do we. If we're gonna build those safer buildings of tomorrow, we have to scan ahead. We have to verify more. Uh, it's an old adage. It's from the sort of Ronald Reagan era. Trust everybody but verify they're actually doing what they say they're supposed to be doing. We're gonna to have to get used to changing the way we look at product requirements, the performance of products and how they're tested. And again, forgive me for saying it, we're gonna to have to get better at changing and managing change and documenting that change. But we shouldn't fear change and we shouldn't fear that guidance changed on a regular basis. We should see that as a positive because actually we're making more changes, we need to react, we can't, let ourselves slip back into sort of complacency. And for me, the wrapper to this is around risk management. I'm used to a world of risk management processes where we identify potential risks. We assess them. How, how sort of large is that risk? How likely is that risk? Then we put in place plans to mitigate those risks, execute those plans and get used to monitoring those. So I see a future world where people talk to me about how we're going to get to this place. Well, actually, I look at a process around managing risk and I think that's what we're going to have to execute. And I see that for architects too. Identifying what are the risks. Risk could be 
contractual. The risk could be physical in terms of what is being built. Getting better at assessing what those risks are and then being very clear, what's the plan to mitigate them? That could be about competency. That could be about training people to understand these processes. That could be about having better levels of sign off that say, actually, I'm an engineer. I'm used to having my work checked. I take it to a responsible adult who checks my work and other people come to me to check work to make sure we've got it right. That could all be part of the plan. That could all be part of the execution. But we shouldn't become complacent. We need to monitor and keep going through that process. And I think when people ask me, well, how do architects satisfy others that they may need to go to to prove that they're getting this right? I think processes like this are the right direction. Documenting processes like this, demonstrating that processes like this work is a way to sort of demonstrate that. Whether that be an insurer or a regulator, they're all going to be looking for this type of behavior because. I believe this is the right sort of behavior that leads you to sort of demonstrate we're doing the right stuff. And we notice if something's wrong, we make changes, we assess, we identify, we plan and we execute. And most critically of all, we monitor to make sure we do what we say we do. So I think, although this diagram is very familiar to me, I think it will become more and more familiar to more and more people. So my hope is that as I hit 30 years in the insurance industry, instead of somebody talking to me about fire risk and telling me what they think, we'll probably have a more of a joined up conversation, you know, where people are actually looking for input into, we've looked into something, we've looked into how it's tested, we've looked into this is our fire scenario, this or these are our assumptions. And we can have a discussion about, do we see risk in the same way? And instead of different views, there's a common view. There's a common understanding of what some of those risks are, because I think that way we're leading to a greater place of safety and not divergent views where we have different outcomes in mind for buildings. We're clear on what the outcome is that we're looking to achieve and it's joined up. And I think in that way, we end in a greater place of safety. So I've run through that at a bit of canter. Hopefully it's been clear what I'm trying to say, but I think it's about clear perspectives on risk, managing risk and i think that's the play that's the way to get to a greater place of safety thank you very much fascinating and i was it was quite shocking to see that photograph of somewhere devastated by fire uh no loss of life but obviously you know damage to property and if you start looking at those as residential uh, places you're looking at damage to people's lives as well and I think you said that that was a so-called acceptable fire in some people's eyes how do you get the profession to really look at that and see it differently and see that it isn't acceptable I, I think that is something that we'll need to do in a, a number of different ways um, one is having discussions like this uh, to sort of highlight that this is the sort of damage that can befall buildings. I think there's also a discussion with regulators to understand, have we got our regulations in the right place? A lot of our regulations are towards life safety, um, but don't talk about disproportionate amounts of damage to buildings. And as we, as we move forward, I think we're gonna to have to sort of make those changes. And I think through both of those vehicles, we can see a change in the future that looks at this and says disproportionate amounts of damage are not what we seek to have. We're going to have to look for different solutions. Thank you. Um, I'm getting lots of really interesting questions coming in, but I think they're probably questions that should be in our group discussion. So I'm going to cut this short now so we have plenty of time at the end. Uh, just thank you very much again. And we are going to walk, move on to our last speaker, who is Paul Bussey of AHMM who has specialised in a number of areas, including fire. Paul, over to you. Thank you, Ruth. And uh, the Building Safety Bill, fire legislation and how this will affect architects. So this is me, um, Paul Bussey, AHMM Architects. I deal with fire and CDM issues on a day-to-day -day basis. I've been doing it for quite a few years and representing the RBA. So I've got a reasonable track record. Um, but um, the Building Safety Bill, what is it about? Biggest changes for 40 years. Um, we've all heard that many times. Will be a significant cultural change and increased levels of competence for all, not just everybody else, but all of us. 
So the Reform Building Safety Bill will cover the performance of all buildings, not just these buildings that are seen to be in scope. The management of fire and structural and safety risk in new and existing buildings in scope as well as additional duties. So all this about 18 metres and seven storeys um, applies for the additional duties, but it will affect all buildings. It's a big misconception. Um, there's an, it's very likely the scope is going to change as well over the years, but we're starting off um, with these criteria. Residents will have a stronger voice. Um, there'll be information that will have to be provided to them and we will have to actively engage with them, but we just still don't quite know how that will work. So the diagram on the left was our construction industry regulatory system in 2017, absolutely unfit for purpose. And the change on the right, none of, which, of any of which you can read, um, but the diagram on the right shows how it should be simplified down. So massive change and Grenfell failed for many reasons. I've highlighted the particular design issues um, supposedly design incompetence or competence were uh, considered major issues and that's being um, trawled through the courts or the, the Grenfell inquiry. Uh, but in the context of what I call regulatory relaxation, uh, approvals and incomprehensibility of legislation. So um, it's a systemic failure. There's a complex creeping myo collective myopia out there. And what can we as architects do? So there's a lot of um, heart wrenching and heart searching being going on, building a safer future from Judith Hackett, um, how that can be implemented and how CIC and the ROBA uh, collectively are going to raise the bar and set the bar for all designers. And this was a little diagram that came from a working group just showing how at the top, the Joint Competence Authority now called the Building Safety Regular Regulator will be set up. There's going to be a principal designer organizationally, but also designated individual project principal designer on the job. And there's new SCEB required, skills, knowledge, experience, behaviors, which is the competence of individuals, which is going to be a bar that's raised at all design stages. Alongside there's an, this new regulator, the building safety regulator, and there'll be increasing visibility during 2021 of them. Uh, we're getting quite late in 2021 and uh, they're still putting their team together at the moment. But the ROBA have certainly um, moved the bar upwards and there's a test for architects, which is very soon going to be reissued in October this year. Um, this is for every architect, but there'll be advanced study for those taking on the principal designer duties. And there'll be further advanced study, uh, arguably, for uh, those principal designers who are dealing with higher risk buildings. But again, we feel these are very wide bars rather than particularly high bars. Uh, but there will need to be experience in these particular herb related buildings. I call it herbs. It's a lot easier to say. So the building safety regulator, as I, as I mentioned, um, in lieu of the joint competent authority and, and Peter Baker is setting that up for, for the government. Um, and Judith Hackett particularly mentioned the fact that um, there's 53 recommendations, but those who create the risk should manage it. And that's very much seen as you as architects. You're doing beautiful designs, but as a consequence, there's risk associated. So you're best to, uh, to, to deal with it, um, not pass it on to a third party. So accountability for design, but responsibility um, is, is essential. And this will continue after uh, completion and into handover to a client. So there'll be other people dealing with these things beyond the handover. Uh, but we've got to concentrate on fire and structural safety primarily, but also other CDM related issues, because currently um, there's a, a not fit for purpose industry out there. So the gateway system introduced this year, August 1st, um, gateway one, a planning stage um, introduction. Uh, whereby a fire statement had to be made. Then we go into gateway two, which requires a full plan submission. Gateway three is occupation. Um, we'll, we'll need a golden thread or um, ev evidence that there is compliance achieved in not only the design, but also the construction. And that will require close liaison with the principal contractor. And then building certificate issued, and then the, the client takes it onto the safety case. So very simple. And looking at the ROBA plan of work, we have a system whereby we've got the gateways overlaid on the plan of work stages, which makes sense, I think. I, I'm not going to go into the detail here, but it helps you understand how these gateways will be introduced on a project. 
So design phase control plans um, and construction stage control plans are essential. It's about demonstrating how you're managing risks um, and, and actually there's going to be a more stringent regulatory authority, regulatory authority um, but it's about competence for all buildings and oversight of all buildings, again not just in scope. So there's going to be a cost recovery regime um, which will be uh, in parallel with additional fire and structural safety emphasis on all buildings. That will be introduced next year, I, I, I imagine. We haven't seen the details of that yet. The RBA have produced this health and safety guide for all architects. So we'll all have to do this from October 2021. It's for five yearly renewals. And um, that is something which will just raise our bar sufficiently to get us into the mode of thinking about your own personal safety and um, other levels, particularly design risk management, which is something which we do, but we don't realize we do. So the RBA have also produced this compliance tracker which relates to the various um, approved document sections, building regulation requirements. Um, it's available out there. It's um, still subject to um, a lot of scrutiny. Um, we as a practice and myself have, have been frankly mapping the approved documents. It's a different system of, of relating to a tracker, but capturing all the, the key components, getting them into a, a coherence across all the approved documents, whether it be structure, sustainability, etc. Um, a large document, but actually annotating the document, demonstrating compliance, that we're working to this particular code, um, we're using this particular um, element of the, of the code, and we're referencing diagrams. Very simply, trying to explain that narratively isn't easy. If we're going to go off piste into the British standards, we can do the same. So we need to take action now. Um, we can't wait for the bill to be enacted because it could be another two years, probably into 2023, um, when it's fully enacted. But we're being asked to, to do this now. And, and that is a bit of a challenge to our industry. Who, who actually, in terms of CDM, it's taken us 26 years to get to where we have. And um, it's a slow process. So we've got to look at his, his managing risks holistically. Um, CDM principles will still apply, um, but they're very much aligned to what we're doing under the Building Safety Bill. And we've got to think about, for example, disabled people. How are they to be evacuated in an appropriate way? Are we just going to stick them in a refuge at the top of the staircase? Or are we going to take more um, assertive action? And that's very much under discussion. In existing buildings, can we be sure that that core is up to 120 minutes um, fire protection and the flat 60 minutes? We need to do surveys and check, and, and even if it's smoke tests on site. We know that our industry cannot deliver um, buildings that are structurally sound or certain parts of the industry. So how are we going to make sure by additional supervision or um, some other sort of method of, of ensuring these things have been delivered? And that is very much part of what we have to do. Internal fire spread, we know, failed at Grenfell. Um, the massive devastation as a consequence of it. How are we going to make sure there is fire stopping, at least in the design, if not in the, in the actual management on site? So control of all these issues and whoever thought of, of installing a new gas main in the staircase at Grenfell and then subsequently exposed in the corridors as in the, in the photographs top left. Absolutely ludicrous situation which was not in compliance with any regulations but happened. So we've really got to think about demonstrating the fire protection, every fire door, every corridor, compartmentation, even voids under floors, uh, making sure that they're all dealt with and delivered. Getting that demonstration is going to be a challenge. Making sure all the cladding and cavity barriers are designed initially and on drawings, meeting the, the approved documents or other documents, and then being delivered on site. There are some shortcomings in current information. It's a bit there, it needs a bit more clarity, but we can work with the government to improve those. We've got various organisations such as the Association for Specialist Fire Protection who can help us. We'll have to use their resources. They can give us good value to improve our current si si situation. And then we've got the printable designer roles, which are very much aligned with the CDM roles. But the intention is to be placed with the designer in control of the design. Not a third party who can sit outside and be a policeman. We need to, the people doing the design need to be taking over this role. And the HSC, uh, together with the building safety regulator, feel this should very much sit with architects, 
but they've left the door open for other people to take it on. Civil engineers, certainly structural engineers on other projects or infrastructure projects, services engineers, uh, but it should be the key designer on the project dealing with these things. And the PAS 8671 should clarify that. The RABA have got a toolkit, which we're um, certainly available for all to deal with CDM uh, compliance. And we're extending this to include compliance for fire issues under the Building Safety Act. Um, the duty, the, the APICD draft secondary regulations, you can read it for yourself um, at the top left there, but it's about the appointment of persons um, and decisions can have, a, obviously design decisions can have a sig significant effect whether a project is delivered in compliance with the building regulations. Well, that's fairly obvious, I think, but we're being asked as principal designers to plan, manage and monitor the design work, ensuring that the design, if built, but even if it isn't, it's still got to comply, um, would comply with building regulations. It's no good producing it because it's not or non-compliant if it's not going to be built, if you're with me. So there's some interesting wording which is very much aligned with the CDM regulations. And going back to cooperate, communicate and coordinate their work with the client, principal contractor and other designers. Well, that's exactly what architects do. And then liaise with the principal contractor. Again, we do that. But we need to liaise on a, an equal basis where they take note of what we say. And that is an issue we're trying to work further with the government. So demonstrating compliance in our drawings, getting them better coordinated and perhaps one system across the industry, getting drawings which are going to have existing refurbishment projects clearly surveyed and the fire times identified um, and some accuracy to that existing uh, fire stopping of services checked, existing compartmentations, and then a standard legend across the, uh, across the profession, rather than every practice having something different to actually demonstrate this. The specifications similarly need to be simplified down to a level of coherence um, and highlighting the key structural or fire issues. And then we, we must demonstrate these on our drawings at the various work stages, the various gateways in a progressive level of complexity of detail. So implication for the industry, um, businesses will need to put in place internal processes that's within the organizational principal designer, architectural practices. Companies should take steps to ensure their staff are adequately trained, hence the training program at the RBA. And then the implications for insurance are by demonstrating what we do and showing compliance, the insurers will have a nice, um, comfortable feel about this thing and, and realize they can actually provide us with PI insurance, even on higher risk buildings. So the CIC are particularly saying high risk buildings um, are in scope, but it will apply to all buildings and the whole construction um, supply chain. So not just buildings in scope, there are currently additional buildings, care homes and hospitals, but there will be a lot of others as well. This is cultural change and, and sort of finally be coming down to the flow chart or the, um, I can't go through this, but it's showing that the from mid 2021 on the left up to mid late 2023 is our program. Um, it'll be fully implemented, they hope by mid to late 2023, but in between there's lots of uh, trigger points of new duty holders, architects registration board and introduction of new gateways. So there's a new industry, interim industry competence committee uh, upon which I've been invited to sit, which is helping the industry understand the competence required of designers, um, working with the government to do that. And this new PAS, again, there's some uh, draft information here about this publicly accessible specification for individual principal designer competence currently under production um, and the sort of things that are required to integrate, um, interpret and interrogate the design, challenging inadequacies and deficiencies, but essentially working as architects with our design team to come up with the appropriate requirements. Again, we can talk about this in the uh, Q&A session, um, how are we collectively going to progressively introduce this? Very open to comments and questions. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I wanted to, to ask you as somebody who has looked so closely at all of this, I mean, obviously in broad sense, we know this is needed. I mean, Grenfell was our wake up call, but obviously we were doing an awful lot that was wrong beforehand. And the idea of the professions 
taking more responsibility for fire safety. I think everybody absolutely applauds. But having looked at it so closely, probably more closely than anybody else here, has do you think it's all getting it right? Or do you think there's anything that's not quite working? Actually, as some of the previous speakers have said, um, that, that actually we've been doing a lot right, but it hasn't been very well joined up. And I think somehow the combination of skills and the realization that we're in an what I call an orchestration role, and I think other again other speakers have mentioned that that we have all the um, utensils at our disposal, but perhaps not deploying them very well, um, and actually bringing that together as an industry is what we can do as architects. But we need the support of a lot of others, and and I call this an orchestration role. I was this morning talking to ASFP, the Association for Specialist Fire Protection, how they can help us with this process. We, I speak to the IFE on a regular basis and other organizations. We rely on structural engineers to do the calculations. We need to have other people that we can rely on in our team, but we have to manage that. It's no good us passing that on to a third party just to administrate it as policemen. Um, we've got to get away from that mentality, which unfortunately CDM has embedded and, and get get back to taking taking overall responsibility, but with mutual liability with these other people. I don't know if that answered your question, but um, I think that's um, the essence of what we're does. trying to I achieve I think it does. I think that's here. really interesting. And I know that somewhere in the, all the details of the legislation, there will, by definition, be one or two things that aren't right. But I think what you're giving is a real endorsement of this approach. I think what I'm going to do now is bring all our other um, speakers back in because I think what I was going to ask you is something that has been raised in a couple of other questions. Um, welcome back everybody. Um, I mean Paul you're working at AHMM which is one of the biggest practices in the country. Um, I'm wondering with this level of knowledge that you have and you're bringing to your practice there's obviously not going to be a Paul Bussey in every practice and I'm wondering how practices are going to bring themselves up to speed. Um, also, somebody asked the question, um, is this the end of the sole practitioner? Um, people doing small projects, small house conversions, etc. I'd be interested to get all your responses to that. Um, and someone else said, well, no one's going to want to pay architects to do this. And again, someone said, well, it'll all go to the project managers because this coordination role will go to the project managers because everybody has lost confidence in the architects. Um, that's a lot of questions, but I feel that they're all related to each other. And I think I'm going to go to Jessica first. Um, I know you're, you're not a sole practitioner, but I think you're still operating in a fairly small practice. Um, so perhaps you could give us your view on this. On on whether it's well the on the... how this works with small practices you know you've talked a lot about how you as a practice think about these things but suddenly mm. there's a whole legislative role yeah. that you have to take and the talk and an extra responsibility for architects yeah i mean i, I hope it's not the end for the for the sole practitioner and the, and the person doing the the one-off house or the, the the extension and the architect's involvement in those projects um something that i was talking about this morning with a with a colleague and and we've we've talked about this as a practice is that actually the proportion of projects that are that go ahead and that are built and designed without any architect being involved at any point um, is also incredibly high so it's about looking at it on the whole it's quite easy when we when we're talking about our world of um, professionals and having professionals involved but actually that isn't always the case um, but as a small practice um, we uh, we very much you know always um, welcome having people from the outside coming to, to talk um, doing CPD but we're also um, what has actually happened through the through the pandemic is that we've um, we're part of a of a group of architects um, in uh, South East London. And we are, there's sole practitioners, small practices. We will actually come together um, to uh, debate uh, uh, items that are particularly pressing or things that are concerning us, things to do with PI, all of those sorts of things. So I think it's the way that we organize ourselves as, um, as an industry and actually how we make sure that all of those practices 
um, large and small share this very, very valuable information. And it's not just a golden thread from one through one project, it's actually the golden thread throughout the profession and that we all need to take responsibility. And with that responsibility, we have a duty to, to make sure that that information is passed to, to, to all professionals. So um, thank you very much. I'm going to come back to Paul. And I know in this possibly in a dual role, because on the one hand, AHMM is obviously benefiting from your enormous expertise. But on the other hand, you are working with the RIBA and I presume that there you're looking at how you can help um, people get up to speed in practices of all sizes. Absolutely, Ruth. And, and that's certainly something that um, we've developed a group called Dyer Haas Designers Initiative on Health and Safety, which is extending to what we call Architects on Fire, um, a, a group to actually try and share from the larger practices who have research capabilities but cascading that down to the rest of the the industry and the profession particularly so we're very happy to get other people's contributions um, and, and getting a general understanding i mean the roba are, are really coming into their own in this or should be frankly um to share this across the industry and i'm very keen to keep the small practitioners i've worked for small practices in the past and, and realizing the, the the importance of that and how we can back them up so that is going to be very much i think the the future going forward um I, I think you know really it's it's working together as a profession and, and i don't think it's the end of the of the small practitioner by any means um but we will have to call in and the person who's saying no one will pay for architects to do this well we've got to start telling the clients we we not only need a structure engineer and a services engineer we need some of these other expertise which might well be approved inspectors who are going to have their names changed but are actually going to be building regs advisors who are going to be on the team and, and the mm -hmm. client is going to have to be responsible for funding those and, and bringing them in. So they could effectively police the process, but they won't understand the creativity of how to integrate that, that building regulation requirement even beyond fire and structure. Sustainability is the big challenge. How you integrate all that into the process um, of, a, of a designer. And as Jessica says, that is the, the, the skill of architects to bring all this together. So I think it's a great opportunity. Perhaps I would because I work in this area, but before I retire, I'd like to see it working safely if, 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 if at all possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think it's fascinating that we're all talking about architects taking back more responsibility. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, over the decades, we have seen more and more taken away from architects in terms of their responsibility and what they're seen as able to do. And I wonder what your response is to um, the person who said, well, you're dreaming, you know, it's all going to go to project managers because um, project managers are the people who are trusted, architects aren't trusted. I'm possibly not so much on the small domestic projects, but on those larger projects, um, it does seem to be the way that things are going. Um, I'd love it to be architects, of course. Um, Jerry, how do you think this is going to be? How do you think that architects are going to work to occupy this space, particularly perhaps not in those um, projects in very sensitive areas, which I know you specialised in, where possibly you're able yeah. to make more of an argument? Yeah, no, well, I, I think it's a really good question. Um, I, I, th I think there's sort of, I guess there's, there's three parts, it's a three part response, you know. Thing number one is I, I think architects have to uh, claim it. I, I think they have to say this is something, this is a problem and we can solve this. This is what we do and we know how to do it. You know, please let us help solve this problem sort of thing. So I, I think we need to be very vocal as a profession that what we do is we coordinate the building process and ensure that things are safe and sustainable uh, and, and that we should be brought on to do that role. Um, and then, and then so sort of then thing number two is, you know, what is the risk of other sort of um, professions coming in and, and sort of taking that from us, if you like. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm not saying it's called predatory, but you know, I mean, you know, can project managers do it? Can can engineering firms do it? Um, the the honest answer is, and I'm sort of trying to show it in the projects in 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 my talk, and we've seen it, you know, certainly in the stuff that Jessica does. You know, for example, it's the same thing where I think that it's really difficult for a sort of someone who is like a project manager to sort of take all of that information and process it and coordinate it 
you know, as well as the architect effectively doing that role as well. And, you know, no matter what scale of project, we're, we're no, no, nearly always now managing a BIM model. You know, even we, we share a office with a few other people and there's very small practices. They're, they're still doing Revit, you know, so they're still creating BIM models of smaller projects. So in terms of that maintaining the golden thread, it's a much smaller jump for architects to, to, to take that role, if you like, than, than anyone else, actually. So again, it comes back mm -hmm. to saying we should do it. And the third thing is, you know, is this the end of the sole practitioner? I, I have to say that if I owned a house and I was in employing someone to, to kind of design it and refurbish it, and I had a choice between an architectural designer who, who, who didn't really have any of this sort of uh, regulatory oversight and didn't have the training that Paul's been mentioning, or, or an architect who had had appropriate training for that scale of project, I, I would definitely go for the architect, I think, because, you know, I've got to live there. And it's, um, you know, the thing that Tom's saying, what does success look like with a building is, you know, it's it's safety and it's, it's making sure the building's burned down. And the thing that Jessica was talking about, you know, health and well-being comes from security. And I would have that from employing, you know, a sole practitioner who's qualified. Yeah, I think absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think it's maybe something that the profession needs to start talking about because it's not immediately obvious to... Um, a member of the public, uh, what the difference is between a building that's fire safe and one that isn't. Um, I've got another a question here. Can you please give your view about the opposition to use of timber structure and cladding? How can we promote reduced embodied carbon in buildings when there is a categoric resistance due to flammability? Now, I have to say there's another of my bugbears going on here, which is um, it's marvellous talking about embodied carbon and exactly where we've sourced this project product from and how long that product's going to last. Frankly, if um, all that goes up in flames, it's certainly the least sustainable thing that you can possibly do. And maybe uh, talking about fire, we should make more noise about that. Um, and the second thing which someone said, and it says self-evidently, and I'm not sure that I believe this is self-evident, Grenfell renders all opposition to structure on fire safety grounds null and void. Now, I'm not sure that that makes a lot of sense, but Tom, what about timber? Um, it's very, very green. It does in certain circumstances burn. Um, how, what's your feeling about it? And I know that, you know, there's been this thing about flammable cladding, about balconies, etc., which has made a lot of use of timber more difficult. I, I guess I should start with the, the preface that as an insurer, I do have a preference for non-combustible buildings because history has shown me that where we use combustible materials, unfortunately that does lead to larger amounts of damage. Now, does that mean we shouldn't use timber? Uh, I'm not saying that. What I think we do need to do is do it deliberately and we, we need to have um, the evidence to support how we use timber and how we design timber buildings. There was something um, that, that Paul said that I wrote down and I'm, I, I rephrased it into the concern with some of those types of buildings is are we designing buildings that actually we can't actually construct properly to make them you know, resistant to fire. I keep seeing timber buildings where somebody after the fact sees one burned down and tells me, well, if it had been built correctly, it would have been okay. And that leads me to a concern that says, have we got it right? And how are we designing these buildings correctly? And I think that's where I think the gap in knowledge perhaps is now that leads to a concern over timber buildings um, and sort of reservations about are we getting them right? Particularly in a world where we have uh, regulatory guidance, which is construction neutral, which seems to suggest build out of concrete, build out of timber, build out of polycarbonate if it can meet the performance, it should be okay. And I'm, I'm not sure that's where we started from. So a long way round, but I think we have to sort of ensure that we're actually designing buildings that we can actually faithfully construct and they will deliver that performance in the event of fire. And we shouldn't kid ourselves that some forms of construction are more damageable than others. They will not be the same. Jerry? Also, I would always defer to the insurer. Um, no, sorry. I mean, I think that, um, you know, the timber building industry in the UK, in, in honest truth, is, is quite young at the moment still, you know. And when we started doing timber frame buildings, uh, 
you know, uh, I've been doing them now for 25 years or something. There were sort of two timber framers in the UK and you had to go to Europe. And it's partly, you know, the thing Paul was talking about with, with testing and having kind of solid data to work from. I don't think that process has been really completed in the UK, if I'm being really honest, in a way that, say, where, where timber frames have a centre of gravity, like, you know, South Germany or Austria and places like that, where they have regulatory frameworks that really understand timber frame buildings and, and make sure you create safe buildings. So I think Tom is right that I, I, I suspect that the regulatory framework hasn't actually been specifically caught up properly yet with the timber frame industry. But the other thing I would say is just a slight aside point about embodied carbon, um, which is not the subject of this webinar. So I'm sorry, Ruth, but you know, th there isn't really anything in the regulatory framework pushing you to have uh, low embodied carbon other than actually, well, you know, Jessica, you talk about the London plan, other than, you know, in the London plan, there's a whole life carbon assessment, but there's no, there's no pressure anywhere to reduce your embodied energy at the moment in buildings. So I, I think that, you know, there needs to be both that and also some, 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 you know, improved uh, guidance, if you like, for timber frames. So I, I do agree with Tom on that. Yeah. I mean, yes, that is obviously a whole other question. I was just, I mean, there is obviously increased pressure. There's increased concern. There are things like the London plan and there are a lot of people moving towards it. It was just, I was making the, in one way trivial, but in another way, not point that if the whole building goes up in flames, you know, it really doesn't matter how you've sourced this or that because you've just released enormous amounts of CO2 and you've got to build all over again. I think that is a key point that we need to think about for the future is, is how do we put sustainability and fire together? Um, yes. Because as we move in one direction yeah. to sort of em embrace this need for sustainability, we have to bring fire safety with it. They're not, we can't do them in separation. It's a dangerous place to go when we separate the two and we yes. build a type of building and forget the fire safety. They have to go together. And that's probably more where we need to be and whether that's different forms of construction or timber construction they must go together and they must mm. be forefront in the mind of mm. designers otherwise we're in an unsafe place and and can i also add in there it's also not just about um sustainability and energy in use but it's also um looking at um because we also do um a lot of uh, flood resilient um work as well it's yeah. also looking at climate change and how that's going to affect um, you know, overheating, all of those things with increased temperatures, increased sea level rises, more cloud bursts, you know, all of those things and fire is part of all of that, um, uh, that consideration. And it all needs to be working together as this sort of net of, of regulation and knowledge that architects um, and all of our, our industry um, need to, to equip themselves with. Someone says, I'm thinking back to a long ago domestic project that involved sprinklers and a fire curtain. Regular testing and maintenance was required. I have no way of knowing if that ever happened, how or who would police this after occupation. I guess that the subtext is, should you put things in that need that kind of um, policing after occupation? Quick fire answers from each of you. I'll start with Paul. I don't know how well this works in Wales, to be perfectly honest, because they have sprinklers there in domestic projects. Um, I agree entirely. It's it doesn't really make a lot of sense that it should be other non-active ways of dealing with fire in the domestic scenario. Tom, I, I look at this and very much think uh, to get to the place of the future with all these new different types of construction, we're going to have to use some of these systems. So we're going to have to figure this out right now for buildings that are subject to the RRO. The enforcement is through the fire service and we will see le legislation that comes forward within the RRO that will talk to regular maintenance of certain features when it comes to firefighting and I believe that will cover all sorts of active systems whether it be fire lifts or sprinklers wet risers dry risers and they'll need monthly checks even in a small building, yes, Jessica. The responsibility of the architect um, and the responsibility of the client, something we haven't actually really touched upon, but you know, when you own a building and you're, and you're responsible for a building, I mean, I uh, live in a, um, in, a, in a muse where we have a, um, a horizontal dry riser that is tested every year, but that's, you know, I'm the, 
I'm the client effectively for that. And that is something that I know is my responsibility. Um, and I think that's it's about have it, taking having the knowledge, knowing that you need to do something and and um, having taking responsibility for for your property and 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 um, your responsibilities, really. So. But I, yes, it, there is clearly a, a gap because how 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 would you know um, that someone is carrying out that routine maintenance? And Jerry, I'll come to you, and you can either answer that question or you can just make any point you'd like to make as a very last point in this discussion because we are drawing to the end. Great. Okay. Um, so. Uh... Okay, well, I don't think outside inspection, by the way, would be the right thing. It is the building owner's responsibility. So it's probably something to do with the insurer and the building owner and that relationship to fix it. But what I would say then, just as a general point, is um, I was really pleased to be invited on this. And it's really lovely to talk to everyone today. And the reason is um, quite often architects, this is the first uh, time I've been on a panel talking about building safety as an architect, which is amazing, isn't it, when you think about it? And it's something that... Um, we need to sort of grab hold of them and say, look, we, we can we can sort this out and we can help make buildings safe. And we sh that's what we should be doing. That's our job. So um, thank you, Ruth, for chairing it. It's been a really positive discussion, I think. Well, I can only uh, echo that. And I think it is fascinating that um, we're looking at something which once would have been considered a very technical subject. And, um, and we're actually looking at this as a way that could help architects to redefine our, their roles and as some of our questions were saying, actually get back to, um, in some ways, go back to a point where architects perhaps had more responsibility, take that responsibility back. Um, and at the same time, and most importantly, um, make our buildings safer for everyone um, and take away fear and we hope reduce damage uh, with its concomitant costs in terms of money and the environment. And I think when you say you're the, it's the first time as an architect you've been invited to be on a panel talking about safety, I'm sure it won't be the last time. I am aware that we are still at the beginning. You know, the act hasn't come through yet, and I'm sure we will be returning to this subject. Um, and I'm really grateful for all the questions that all of you have been sending in because it's lovely to see this level of engagement. So. Thank you very much. Thanks to all our speakers. Thank you very much on behalf of Architecture Today and of Shuko. And yes, I'm sure there will be more on this subject. There will be more webinars on other subjects of great concern as well. And I look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you all very much and goodbye.